Hey everybody, Brendan here. Welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be covering uh, round two of the Excelsior February Open. Uh, today I am playing against Ryan Z, and I'm playing with the white pieces. So I have previously played Ryan once at this point, uh, and uh, that game was going my way. I was up a piece, and I blundered mate in the middle of the board in like some sort of ending, uh, which was not great. So... I'm out for revenge. And uh, can I get it? We'll have to see. All right. Uh, so I started with the move e4, as always. We see e6, d4, d5, knight to c3. And we see knight to f6. No uh, taking on e4, no winnower, nothing. Um, this is quite a uh, popular move in and of itself. Probably one of the more testing moves, actually. Uh, if you look at things from like a correspondence perspective, which I've been like s kind of getting into uh, as of late. So e5, uh, knight f to d7, f4, c5. These are all just the main lines. Um, and uh, yeah, this was probably what I'm weakest in um, or was weakest in at the time, in my opinion, uh, because I did put a lot of time mainly into those winnower lines because they're very, very forcing and they're, very, very complicated. So if you don't know your stuff, you could just find yourself lost out of the opening. Um, but here it was like, okay, I have at the center. I have some principles I can follow. So I can hope for the best. Uh, we see knight c6. Bishop to e3 and a6. So this is the last move I actually remembered. Um, and uh, the course that I was following for this repertoire recommends the move a3 here. Uh, but I had not studied this. Um, before this game so yeah kind of the only thing I do remember from these is like bishop d3 is just kind of one of those nice moves to play uh, so that's what I ended up going for but of course a3 is something that I, I I should have likely played and was a focus of mine actually moving forward so I didn't uh, make that mistake again so bishop to d3 b5 and queen to d2 they ended up taking on d4, which I think is actually just an inaccuracy. So I thought much scarier was uh, c4, bishop e2, b4, knight d1. Um, I didn't hate this position when I saw it, but they do have a lot of space here. So um, there are some things that they can do with that, uh, just going for their queenside play with uh, moves like a4. I think even a5 and uh, a5, a4, and a3 is... Um, not such a bad idea as that has some like it, it it's kind of similar to the king's indian attack in a way um at least visually when you see this type of structure so that's the first thing that uh, comes to my mind is is bring that pawn to a3 that's usually a good source of counterplay uh but they ended up taking on d4 and i was pretty happy with this it feels pretty cooperative um to relieve tension and uh to choose not to gain space there so uh, I ended up taking on d4 very happily, bishop b7, and uh, I took on c6, because of course. Uh, and after they take on c6, now there's some things that I got to wrestle with here. Um, first off, where do my pieces want to go? And how do I get them there, right? So it's not actually just about that. It's also what about their pieces? I think one of the first things I would do if I was black is I would probably just play d4 at some point if i could uh just to open up that bishop even if it sacrifices a pawn that looks incredibly nice um and that's why i just played knight to e2 uh the idea here is just to play knight to d4 and prevent any sort of d4 sacrifices at all whether or not they're good it looks practical and uh if you can avoid them being able to make practically uh strong looking moves then that's always nice so uh, really, I'm just trying to play against their bishop by bringing my knight to a pretty decent square. They played knight b6, um, which was fine. I, I wasn't really too concerned about it. I ended up playing knight to d4. Of course, I would be extremely happy about something like knight c4. Um, I imagine I could play even queen c1 here, but uh, let's just say I even take uh, and... I don't know if casting long is the smartest thing to do but this doesn't even look so bad actually wait, wait my apologies i can just take here forget that not important okay so they couldn't even do that 
Uh, bishop to d7. <laughs> Uh, it's been a while since I looked at this game. Uh, but yeah, bishop to d7. And then I played this move b3. It looks ugly, right? Uh, you're weakening the queen side. And clearly, they want to play on the queen side uh, when you see this bishop. But it's actually a very strong move. And it's hard to do anything with this knight anymore. So uh, white actually has a pretty decent advantage already. Now, queen c7 was played. I ended up castling short. Uh, there's not really a reason to cast long. That's actually the worst thing to do, probably. Just because uh, with this move b3 added, it's just not smart. Um, it gives them something to attack on the queen side to try to open up lines. Uh, they played bishop c5. And now I play queen f2. And this is a multi-purpose move. So the first idea is quite obvious. It helps with the defense of the knight on d4. But it also has some other ideas. For example, queen h4 at some point uh, could be of annoyance if they end up castling short for example uh there's there's some mate threats and they might have to create some weaknesses like g6 which is never really a move you want to make in the french uh it also helps with this uh move f5 as well so there are uh, quite a bit of benefits to this queen d2 f2 maneuver and um this i remember seeing slightly um before so I was. That's why I played this type of setup of bishop d3 and then queen to d2. So I still had this route of getting to the uh, the f2 square. We see rook c8 and now rook a to d1, uh, just preparing to potentially need to defend this knight a little bit more. Castles and of course, as mentioned before, queen h4. Uh, this just looks like a very strong move, and I'm trying to create some weaknesses here. They go g6. I don't see anything. Um, much better. But now, unfortunately for them, I have this move rook f3, uh, which is another idea uh, that, that's kind of nice of casting short. It's more of a happy coincidence than something intentional. Uh, but things are just kind of going very well against their king here. And uh, yeah, it's hard to suggest that much. For example, if they play h5, trying to prevent anything, I could actually just go uh, either rook g3 or I could still go rook h3 um, or some form of g4 uh, and just play this move. And their king is actually much weaker than mine. So there's not really much to worry about there. They end up going queen to d8 and uh, offering a queen trade. Of course, this is something I want to avoid. Uh, there's no reason to allow it. Even if strategically I could have a better position. Let's just say I magically have these pieces traded off. Um, oh, sorry, not this one. These two, these three, the four. There are four pieces. These are four pieces. If I had this scenario, um, well, that's that's getting to the point of like just strategically winning. I think strategically white is better right now. Um, but with all these other pieces on, it's hard to just force that imbalance, especially against such a strong opponent uh, like Ryan. So not uh, something I want to do. So that's why I ended up playing queen h6, keeping queens on the board uh, and continuing to try to provoke some sort of advantage or weaknesses. Um, yeah, and um, that's kind of what f5 does. So f5 is a very natural reaction because how do you stop rook h3? Like if you go rook e8 or something, rook h3 comes and how do you stop queen h7? You just don't. Uh, so f5 is kind of the best option here. Um, but there's other problems that come with it. So I didn't play the best move here. I played a good move. This one still offers pretty good winning chances uh, and is likely just clearly better for white. But there is a move that's most likely just winning. And that's just g4. Uh, I did consider this in the game, and you'll see why in a moment. Uh, because it just it does follow very similar paths. Uh, but I was a little bit concerned of any complications here. Um, mainly with any ideas of like rook f7 and, and uh, bishop to f8. But I actually didn't really have to worry much here. If they go uh, bishop to f8, I can just go back. And uh, there's always threats of taking on uh, g6. There's always moves like king h1 and rook uh, d to g1 and adding more pressure. It's very difficult to defend comfortably here, uh, even if there's not something necessarily immediate. So uh, that's something to point out for sure. But instead of g4, I played queen h3. And this is just 
so I don't have to worry about my king or my queen getting kicked away after some sort of bishop to f8. So queen to h3. Um, now queen to e7 was played. g4, of course. There's not really uh, much else to consider. And then we see the move knight to e a8. And this is kind of where, like, you start thinking, like, okay, this is winning. Um, when you see a move like knight a8, uh, a knight going to the side of the board... You you can be down a decent amount of material, but you see a move like that and you just immediately think like there's got to be something or like the, there's got like it just has to be close to winning, um because this knight doesn't have a future like it's it's not even just that okay the knight on b6 you know knight on c7 is better because it can go to e it can't go to e6 where does it go to e8 and then g7, um it, it feels like extremely slow and I think uh, I just kind of like locked into these variations where. Uh, it's just hard to find good moves for them. So uh, I ended up playing king h1 here. This is quite an obvious move. Um, it steps off this diagonal for one. Uh, but most importantly, it allows me to play this move rook to g1 and uh, try to open up lines uh, with uh, g takes on f5. So they end up playing rook to f7. Rook to g1 now. Uh, setting up a positional trap as well, where if I take, now they have to take with the e pawn, which is not ideal. And now they play rook c to f8. And there's actually just a... Um, uh, you, you can just kind of force a win at this point, which is really nice. And um, I managed to find a variation that I was quite happy with. Um, if they end up going king h8, for one... Uh, I think taking and uh, playing something like rook f to g3 is is quite unbearable. Uh, moves like queen h6 uh, could be quite annoying. Um, there's always threats of knight takes f5 as well uh, if if these pieces ever leave the defense of this bishop. And uh, it it's just very unpleasant. They can't really counter anything here. Uh, and it's just not fun to look at, really. Uh, another option, of course, was knight c7, um, where you can take as well, and uh, with the idea of bringing the knight to e6, but it's just too slow. Knight takes f5 uh, likely just wins the game on the spot. And the idea here is bishop takes f5, bishop takes f5, and uh, we're just winning a pawn, and we're able to play bishop to d3. But rook c to f8, we have to kind of keep looking. Um, this is an important move to look at because, well, f4 um, could be undefended or anything. But luckily, we're kind of just in time here just to take take and uh, play this move bishop to d3. If they want to take on f4, uh, it's not going to end well. They realistically just shouldn't. Um, we have this extremely strong e-pawn. Uh, but maybe even more than that, moves like bishop takes g6 uh, likely just win. Just because we're just uh, opening up their king. And it doesn't really matter if they take there. We have moves like, uh, I think, bishop to e8 looks decent. Oh, queen h7. <laughs> that's, that's a little bit better. So, yeah, it doesn't really work out for them. So, they played rook c to f8. But now there's a really cool tactical flourish we can make here. With uh, g takes f5. Uh, they cannot play g takes. So, they have to play e takes. And this is where the cool move comes in. I was very happy with this move. Uh, turns out you can play e6, and this wins a piece. And the whole reason is, well, we just have to look at kind of the coordination, like what's going on here. So this queen is helping defend this e6 square, but it's also helping defend this bishop. And uh, it's kind of overloaded in the weirdest way possible. So after e6, uh, bishop takes and um, knight takes. The thing is, if they try taking on e3, we can always just take back. Right, and we're defending our knight. We don't even have to take on f8. Go into complications. We um, just take on e3. So that would not work out for them. But what else can they do? Uh, because if they take on d4, we take on f7 with check, and then we also take on uh, d4 right back and win material. Uh, so very weird tactical theme here of um, an overloaded queen trying to defend this piece and actually unable to deal with this pawn. Very surprising. So, uh, yeah, things don't really... They go a little bit longer, but um, things are kind of over now. Uh, rook g7. I took on d7. 
they took on d7 as well. And uh, knight takes f5. So when it rains, it pours, right? Uh, now knight takes f5, knight h6 check is a threat. They can't really take on uh, f5 comfortably because, well, there's just a lot of reasons. First off, uh, we can just take on c5. We can also take on g7. Uh, their position is just falling apart, right? They're down material already. And um, when you're down material, usually it's easy to lose more material because sometimes you just don't have the defensive resources for it because you have less material to defend uh, or to use to defend things. So bishop takes e3 was played. I played knight h6 check, just going for the trades and trying to make things as simple as possible, uh, which I think was the right strategy. They took on f4. And uh, actually, I had calculated after knight takes f5, I calculated this whole sequence, which I was quite happy with, which is uh, rook takes f4, rook e8 check, king g7, uh, rook takes a8, king takes on h6, and then rook takes a6. And I wanted to make sure they couldn't get the second rank or anything, and they just can't, uh, not in any comfortable way. So b4, a4 now, uh, they kind of have to take on passant, and now this pawn's just going to be pushing through. So... Um, it's, yeah, it's just a winning position, right? Not much to discuss there. I play rook a4 here, offering a trade, because it doesn't hurt. They play d4. Now it's time to start pushing. So b4, rook to e6, b5, uh, rook to f8 here. Rook takes on d4. If we can catch more pawns and take them off the board, then uh, we should be happy about that. Rook to b1, rook to b6 here, uh, and now c4. Right, we have two pass pawns. Might as well use them both. Rook c8 and uh, rook d5, just helping uh, push both both of the pawns through. Normal technique here, nothing too crazy. C5, rook e6, and I don't blame my opponent for playing on. If you think, oh, why is why why are they playing on? They're down a piece and down a couple pawns. Check out our last game uh, that we played against each other. In the playlist, it should be game number 119 or 120. Uh, it was the last game of 2022, and it I was completely winning, and then I lost it. So don't blame them in the slightest. Uh, b6, king to e7, bishop to f1. Very happy with this move. The idea is just it's not useful uh, where it is, and if I can bring it to h3, all of a sudden it's covering the queening square, and it's also kind of annoying these two rooks, which don't really have comfortable squares to go to. So uh, rook to b8. Bishop to h3, rook c6, bishop to d7 now, uh, rook to f6, c6, uh, rook f to f8, c7, it's almost over, rook b7, uh, and bishop c6, doesn't hurt to play, rook takes c7, pawn takes c7, rook c8, and now bishop to d, uh, rook to d7 check, and now my opponent resigned, because, yeah, it is just over now, I'm gonna be playing uh, this rook over to b8, and there's just not a way for them to come up with any way to um to trick me anymore. As I will just be, um, at the very least, if they want to take on c7, then I'll be two rooks and a bishop up versus a king and two pawns. There's just, there's nothing, clearly. Um, so I think this was a good point for them to resign. Anyways, uh, yeah, uh, lots of interesting things happened. Uh, I would say the big learning lesson uh, for me uh, is mainly just this uh, bishop d3 move. I think that's like the only mistake I can really uh, credit myself with uh, without being too harsh because uh, if we go further and we look at this g4 move, yeah, like this is an improvement and it is a faster way to win. Uh, but there are complications involved and it's not like it's... It's hard to say that it's not like just a complete win because it, it is actually just completely winning, but... Making a move like this, like, uh, queen h3 still offered me an advantage, and I feel like that's okay. Uh, that's totally fine. But that is actually likely the biggest problem uh, I made, or mistake that I made this game, is I'm not capitalizing enough on my mistakes, which is actually potentially a huge problem where I could be letting my opponents go, getting letting them back in the game. So that is something definitely to watch out for uh, in the future. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed. And I will see you in game number three. All right. Bye-bye.